Hello everyone, today is Thursday, February 16, 2017, and this is the week in charts. I want to thank everybody for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. It looks like we've got a pretty good crowd again this week. So again, I'm uh, I'm humbled and I want to thank you for being here. So what are we talk about? Well, we're going to continue to do a lot of the things we've been talking about lately. Uh, obviously, we have a bull leg underway. So far, so good. Looking pretty good. Uh, obviously, your questions on trading and your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, wait till we get to the charts before you ask, start asking about stocks. And then ask about one stock at a time. And that's for your benefit to make sure I cover all your stocks. You could ask about 100 stocks. Just ask about them one at a time. So what are we going to talk about? Well, following a methodology. And it is the hardest, easiest thing that you will ever do. And that's going to make a lot more sense in just a few minutes. Before we do that, that's the disclaimer screen. I can sum it up pretty quickly. All predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that line from Greg Morris, except I don't think he used the word stuff. <laughs> anyway, um, last week we talked about the open portfolio. And it was a bit of a warts and all type of presentation. And a lot of times in these presentations, I show you how everything is going great. But I also like to balance that out and show you that sometimes things don't always go great. But the thing to do is what you do. You just keep following your methodology. You stay the course. And the point I was making last week, based on the whipsaw song, you get a whip and I get a saw, one good trend pays for them all. That's Ed Sakota which he performed live for us a couple of years back at the American Association of Professional Tactical Analysts meeting. He whipped out his uh, banjo and played his little song, which is very nice of him. Anyway, the point I was making there is just one big winner would make all the difference in the world. And the thing to do is just continue to follow along, even though sometimes it may not work out. So let's fast forward to this week. Remember last week over here, the portfolio was on the cusp of going negative, the open portfolio, that is. In fact, this is actually a closed trade here. Remember, we're looking for a swing trade on the first half, or the first loaf, as I often say, and then a trend trade on the second loaf. So if you just take out this one closed trade here, then this would actually be negative. Now, the reason I leave the closed swing trades in is, number one, they don't make that big of a difference. And number two, if I took them out, it would create mass confusion for those who are newer to the methodology. So I like to show the whole trade. And number three, it is part of the whole trade, uh, depends on how you want to look at it, from a monetary standpoint or from a psychological standpoint. I think it's good to see a little swing trade in there and then the trend trade underneath, and this might turn out to be good, bad, or indifferent. But if it turns out to be great, it's like, well, you can't regret taking the swing trade. If it turns out to be, if it turns out to go zero on the second loaf, then you still obviously can't regret taking the swing trade because otherwise you would debate anything. And then, of course, you also can't regret not taking 100% at the swing trade. Now, that was last week. Let's take a look at how that shaked out. Again, we had a small gain on the overall portfolio. It was on the cusp of going negative. And again, it would be negative without the swing trade. I don't put the swing trades in to make things look better, although they do. And they are actually part of the portfolio, if you think about it. But I leave them in there so you can see the entire trade and to, and to stop confusion to those other reasons I just gave you. Now let's take a look at the portfolio as of last night. And you could see that things have turned decis decisively positive over last week. Now it won't always work out this way, but as you can see, it pays to pay attention for what they do. So this is a massive swing if you look at it. 
Remember, this is on a hypothetical, let's keep it for educational purposes only, right? 100K account. So that's a pretty big swing. That's uh, oh, 3% or so swing in just one week. Better than the poke in the eyes, what I say. Now, the other thing you'll notice here, uh, if you go back one slide, you'll notice that I had two setups coming into last week. And these are the same two setups. So one of them actually triggered and the other one hasn't triggered just yet. And it looks like it might not even trigger. But the point I wanted to make, and then we'll follow up on this setup too in upcoming weeks. And then I'm not going to keep putting the new setups in the portfolio covered every week, although occasionally I might. I just want to follow up on this one portfolio and use it as an example, good, bad, and different, and obviously so far so good, of why you should stay the course even if things don't turn out great in this case so far they did now what i also wanted to show you about this this additional trade in here now of course it ain't over yet so we don't know what's going to happen but so far so good maybe today notwithstanding on this particular trade here now i thought it'd be interesting to point out the fact that if you're coming in to the trade and you're looking at the portfolio and you're seeing all these losses and you're seeing some of these profits begin to erode a little bit, your confidence might be a little shaken and you might begin to think, as we say in Fargo, oh, geez, oh, geez, you know. And because your confidence is shaken, you might not take this new trade. And that's something that you have to wrap your head around. And that's one thing that I often talk about is, and I think Douglas once said it, when you make a trade, it's not necessarily that one trade, or I should say when you lose on a trade, it's not necessarily that one trade, but it's all the trades prior to it. And the same thing goes true for life. Let's say your spouse does something that aggravates you. It's not that one little thing in and of itself, or your millennial child does something that aggravates you. It's not that one little thing in and of itself that really sets you off and makes you look like a psycho. It's everything they've done prior to that, everything that led up to that. Well, as Douglas says, with a trade, when you have that losing trade, it's like you're having the feeling of all the losses prior. I told this to a client once, and he's like, wow, that makes so much sense, and that's why I'm repeating it to you today. So the point is that with the portfolio on the verge of going negative and you're going into a drawdown, you might not have the, the mental capabilities, not the mental capabilities, but you might not have the, um, what word am I looking for? Guts, okay, to take that next trade, knowing that it might actually be yet another losing trade. So it becomes pretty tough. So as you can see, and again, it doesn't always work this well. I probably spend too much time trying to temper everyone's expectations. But as you can see, it pays for when it does. So we're going to have to say bye, Felicia, to the fat lady for now because it ain't over. Now, it's not as easy as I make it look, or, or is it? So how do we go from a portfolio that's on the cusp of going negative, and again, completely negative if you take out that profit from the swing trade that was in there. So how do we get from going from that nearly negative portfolio to one that's up nicely in just one week? Was it hard? Well, nothing was done. Absolutely nothing was done to go from that crappy portfolio to that good portfolio, decent looking portfolio, within a week. Just follow it, right? There's nothing that had to be done. There were no changes. There was nothing, absolutely nothing that had to be done. So is it really that easy? Well, yes and no. We're not exactly made to trade. The same things that are keeping you alive and well are often detrimental to your trading. And that goes from a physiological level, and that also goes from 
a psychological level. Now, if you think about it, on a psychological level, in order to function as a, as a human being, you have to have a great deal of control. In order to be successful as a human being, you have to have a great deal of control. We are people of action, especially those of you who are successful, and I'm guessing that everyone here is successful in life, especially because you're taking time out of your busy schedule to possibly learn something or possibly find an opportunity later in the chart show when we get to the charts or possibly gain a different perspective that you might not have thought about. So, again, I'm flattered that you're here. You're a person of action. Unfortunately, in trading, a lot of times there's no action to be taken. So we've done absolutely nothing. If you don't count the new trade, let's say let's say that trade didn't trigger. If you don't count the new trade, absolutely nothing was done, and the portfolio had this vast improvement. Being right is tough. As you can see, or if you go back and look at the tape on this, that portfolio was pretty crappy. You were pretty wrong, but you were doing okay. Now, one lesson that I thought that might came, come out of it is that we lose on a bunch of trades, but we make so much on one trade, like the Whipsaw song says, one big winner pays for them all, and that would be the lesson. Well, so far, so good. Everything, for the most part, seems to be working. But if you were wrong as much as you will be wrong trading in life, you would be a miserable failure. You can't kill half of your patients and still expect to be a doctor. You can't have half of your bridges fall down, or even less than half. You can't even have one fall down, right? And still be a lawyer. I'm sorry, still be an engineer. Um, <laughs> so we are people of action, and a lot of times it's hard for us not to do anything. We have no control over the market, and I think I'm going to reiterate this, I think it's at a slide coming up, but as Douglas once said, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. And that is, that's true. It's very much true. Now, getting back, now, for of course, unless, of course, I'm sorry. So, unless you're willing to embrace these things, life is going to be pretty hard, okay? So we're not really made to trade because the trading world is much different than the real world unless, of course, you're willing to embrace these physiological and psychological aspects which can deter your success. So getting back to the physiological part, we have this little tiny part of our brain the called the amygdala which scientists argue over what makes it up. It's part of the limbic system and all. But you can't argue that compared to the rest of the brain, it's really not that big. And I'm not a neuroscientist, and nor do I play one on TV. But I do occasionally stay at Holiday and Express. So let me give you my two cents on why I think it's just such a little bitty tiny part of your brain. I think it's a little tiny part because it's very efficient being a very small part. And we need that amygdala to live, okay? It has to work very quickly. When you accidentally step out in front of that taxi cab that's charging you, you need this reflexive action to get you out of the way, okay? It's that flight or fight type of thing. So you have to get out of the way right away. You don't have time to contemplate your navel and, as I often say, think about how that taxi cab driver might feel about you and wonder why is he speeding and blah, blah, blah. By that time, you're dead. So we need this in life to function as a normal human being. And the amygdala is responsible for the perception of emotions. And I think that's kind of interesting. The perceptions of emotions such as anger, fear, and sadness. Now, as I've said quite often, and I'm borrowing a lot of this from this introduction course, introductory course of trading, and you'll see that in a few more slides. 
that I've been working on for the last couple of years. I finally started filming, by the way, so it's it's getting there. Um, but as I've said before, the way you kind of tiptoe past your fears is you don't want to wake up that 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 panic monster when it comes to trading. And one of the simplest things you could do, there's quite a few exercises that we talked about in the past, but one of the simplest things you could do is when you feel that emotionally charged thing begin to happen, just give yourself a few seconds. And a lot of times that's all it takes is just a few seconds to avoid that reaction. And as I've said quite a few times, it's like next time you feel like you want to lash out at your spouse with this immediate reaction. And, and I'm very guilty of it, too, because I, I told my wife that I talk about this, and she's like, really? You know, <laughs> why don't you practice what you preach? You know, uh, that's all implied. But count to three before you have that action, and you're going to be surprised at how many times you're going to pull back a little bit because by giving yourself a few seconds, and that's all it takes to get from this little part of your brain, there's one on each side, to the rest of what's sloshing around up here and to reason through it and think about whether or not you should say what you say. Now, what my wife doesn't know is how many times since I've been studying this amygdala that I actually have counted to three inside of my brain. If you could just take a deep breath before you say what you're going to say, and, and I tend to snap a lot. I'm a very type A type of person. So all it takes is a few seconds to get past that. So that's one of the physiological things that you could work on. Um, I, would, I would encourage you to read uh, Dr. Robert Barrer, um, the Kaizen way. Uh, he gave a really good speech a couple of months back in Vegas when I was at the Traders for a Cause conference. And he talked a lot about fear and the... Uh, caveman brain or the emotional brain, the lizard brain, and, and these things that, that occur in stress. And it was a very fascinating speech. And, and that when you get into this emotionally charged state, it's like the rest of your body shuts down and this these primal instincts take over. And all it takes a lot of times is just a few seconds to kind of bypass that part of your brain. Now, one thing you have to be very careful of when you're trading is that outcomes are very noisy. And I, I couldn't remember where I got this from, but I, I did a little Googling this morning and I found where I originally read this from. Uh, I think it originally, I got it from the Kurt Report, but it was also in some behavioral finance books that I have laying around here. And by outcomes are noisy, I mean that sometimes crappy trades make money, and sometimes good trades lose money. So you cannot get deterred when it comes to trading. And you have to remember that those those outcomes can be really noisy. Has anybody seen this Spicer thing? I was about to give up on SNL because it just wasn't funny lately. And then I saw this Spicer skit. <laughs> it's hilarious. Anyway, before I digress too far, now, I've told this story quite a few times, but I can't help myself because it's so damn relevant. Experience is the best teacher. And the first time I heard that phrase, I was about 15 years old. I might have been a little bit younger, but right around that age. I know I had someone who was a little bit older than me because uh, I don't know if I was driving at the time and I needed them to pull this little boat that I had to go skiing. And I had my run skiing, and I got out the water and grabbed a Coke or whatever, and then grabbed the helm. And I started putt-putting over to these, these little kids that I, had to, I felt like I had to save them. They were jumping up and jumping off and sliding off of this huge piece of styrofoam. It was huge. And it's styrofoam, they, I'm guessing it looked like, because of the shape of it, it looked like something that was used to float like a huge pipeline and maybe a hurricane or a storm or something broke it free and it was floating down the bayou. And I wanted to go warn these kids because 
styrofoam, it doesn't seem that abrasive, but it is. I remember when we were kids and we'd go to the beach and we'd buy these cheap styrofoam surfboards and we'd surf on them all day and have a blast. Just not like stand up surfing, but laying on our bellies. And we'd have a blast. But by the end of the day, our whole front was chafed. Legs, belly, you name it. And especially your nipples got really, really chafed. And I know it sounds kind of bizarre, but you couldn't sleep that night. It's just, it was a very painful experience. And it, it happened to be once or twice as a kid. That's like never again. And I felt like it was my duty as a human being to go over to these kids and tell them, look, kids, you guys need to stop playing on this big piece of styrofoam because you're going to get really chafed. And my buddy reached over and he turned the wheel away from them. And he said, Dave, experience is the best teacher. And I've never forgotten that. And that's been my mantra throughout life. So in life experience really is the best teacher. And of course, in trading, you're going to need some experience. Unfortunately, the market can often be a really bad teacher. In the layman's guide to trading stocks, I wrote, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. Now, about a year or two after that, I was giving a lecture, and someone came up to me after and said, hey, Dave, now you have met an unsuccessful paper trader. I'm like, oh, okay, well, how long have you been trading? He's like, three weeks. It's like, oh, okay, well, you don't count. Anyone who is serious about trading and who has researched the methodology, okay, it's like I, I guess I need to qualify that a little bit. It, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader who was serious about trading, okay? But once real money is on the line, things begin to change really quick. The market might encourage you to take small profits before they evaporate. Let's say... You make a little on a trade, and then bam, you end up losing money on a trade overall. Then you make a little bit on a trade, and you end up losing money overall. You reach a point where it's like, well, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. Yet in trading, that's often what you have to do. You have to keep taking those trades, provided that you've done your homework and it's viable. You're following a viable methodology. So the next couple of trades come along, you start taking those little profits, and you're like, oh, I'm just start taking these profits. And you start feeling good about that. And then, of course, you miss big winners. And then the other thing that could happen is, especially based on prior trades and experience, where you might be stressed out because you've been losing money, you put that next trade on, and instead of letting it stop out at your stop, you decide to micromanage yourself out and get out really early because you don't want to lose any money. So as soon as you start losing a little money, you get out of the trade. What happens? Well, you're not going to make any money if you get out of the first sides of adversity, because nearly all trades will go against you at some point. And then in the end, all trades will eventually end badly, as I often speak of. Now, on the flip side of that, the market will often encourage you to hold on to big losing trades. And we've had a few trades in more recent times. Now, some of them were discretionary calls, so I don't want to confuse you up too much with that. But we've had a few trades that I can think of in recent times that have stopped out and then later taken off and done incredibly well. So, yes, that may have occurred, and it has occurred in more recent times, a few times. But longer term, holding on to a losing trade it's not the way to go. So let's say you get a losing trade and you bail out because you've already it's already exceeded your stop loss. And you've said, okay, well, it's not coming back. I'm just going to bail out because it's getting worse. And then what happens? It takes off without you. So that happens two or three times. And you're like, you know what? Screw it. I'm not going to let. I'm not going to be fooled again. I'm not. I'm not going to let the market shake me out. And then of course that turns into a huge loss. And there's a plethora of other bad behaviors. And then I, I, this was a slide I borrowed from a course. So it's like there's a lot of things that, that need to be covered. It's going to take a while to cover everything that the market will encourage you to do. But these are some of the big ones. And quite often the market will encourage you to 
not only have these bad behaviors, but obviously micromanage yourself out of a lot of good trades. And the reason it does that is because we are people of action. We are programmed to avoid pain. And again, the same things that are keeping us or making us, allowing us to function as normal human beings and succeed or the same things that might be detrimental to us in the trading world. Now, one thing I've talked about quite a bit before, this is another slide I borrowed from the, from the course, from the psychology section, is as humans, we are often guilty of associating a profit from bad behavior in a trade as actually a skill. And then we are also associate, on the flip side, we associate a loss just as bad luck. And, and then in my Googling this morning to try to figure out where I initially studied these things in one of these behavioral finance books, I, I was able to find the author. And it's Terrence O'Dean. And he's the one who talks a lot about the outcomes being noisy. Markets generate a lot of data, but they don't generate a lot of clear feedback. Outcomes are noisy. Good decisions may have bad outcomes. Bad decisions may have good outcomes. Good outcomes. We all have a tendency to take credit for our successes while blaming our failures on bad luck or others. So that's another one of those human nature things that's just it just what it is. It is what it is. You just have to embrace that. Now I thought it'd be interesting to throw this slide in here this week. And again, I keep borrowing from the course because everything's already done as far as the slides are concerned. You have to really make sure you know your methodology. And, and the, the easiest way for me to explain this is to explain a methodology that I don't believe in, that I don't trade, and that would be reversion to the mean or selling options or something along those lines where you have a very accurate system and it makes a little bit of money in every trade. It's almost like a so-called income producing system. Unfortunately, it has a huge blow up characteristic. And that's a very tough position to be in to, to do incredibly well and consistently make money. Just chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it, and then blow up and then try to come back from that. So you have to make sure you really know your methodology. Now, with my stuff, it's not perfect either. It can be streaky at times. And again, I've said quite a bit, a mentor of mine told me to stop calling it streaky. You make it sound too elusive. Well, sometimes it can be a little elusive. You print money for a while, and then you go back to grinding it out. Who was it? Was it Gelber that said three months out of the year, you're, you're print money and you feel great. You can't sleep because you're so excited. Three months out of the year, you're, you're so cold. You can't hit the side of the barn. You can't sleep because you're stressed out. And then the other six months, you grind it out. Make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little, wondering if you ever make any real money in this game. Well, that describes trend following quite a bit. Now, I've worked really hard over the years to develop things such as a money and position management plan, which allows me to mitigate some of the problems with the trend following while still allowing myself for those large gains, occasional gains, okay, position myself for both. A pure trend following methodology, longer term trend following methodology is, as I often preach, your returns could be phenomenal, but your drawdowns are going to be abysmal, and it's going to be very tough to trade that type of, of system. But the real money is in the trend following. So you don't make enough money short-term trading, and a good example of that would be the reversion to the mean type systems that I was just talking about. The real money is in long-term trading, but the dilemma is that's also – a huge amount of risk. So I've spent a lot of time working on a hybrid approach to make these things work, but it's still not perfect. And you're still going to have bad times. You're still going to have to grind it out. You're still going to have times where you have to be really, really patient. 
And again, that goes against human nature, especially if you are a person of action. Now, last week we talked about regret. And regret at trading is, could be, it's two regrets, right? You have, you regret that you lost money, and then you regret that you have a missed opportunity. Now, here's one thing that if you're willing to embrace it, take it as fact and embrace it, your life will get a lot easier. The regret over a missed opportunity, as we talked a little bit about last week, is a much bigger emotion than the emotion associated with a loss. When you miss a big opportunity, it's like you kind of replay that over and over in your head. Think about some of the opportunities in your life that you didn't take. Okay, how, how much have you kicked yourself for not taking them? Well, that's a pretty big emotion. And it's a lot bigger than the emotion of a loss. And so a lot of times, if I'm kind of a, a little nervous about a trade because I know it's going to be a little risky, maybe the stock's a little volatile, maybe the market's not 100%, but I really like the setup, the way I kind of wrap my head around it and take it is like, well, number one, like we said last week, we get paid to put money into cap. I'm sorry. We get paid to put money into harm's way. We get paid to put capital in the harm's way. I think is the original quote. So we have to be willing to take that loss. We have to accept it, embrace it. As I've written about before, and others have written too. It's not an original thought. You almost have to see that loss as a cost of doing business, and see it as a very likely and or possibility. And the reason to say likely, I mean, obviously you don't want to lose on a trade. You want to stack, trade when the odds are stacked in your favor. But it is very much possible. Again, outcomes are noisy. And the other thing that I think about is like, okay, well, it's only going to be 2% barring overnight gaps on my account. I could survive that. The opportunity could be tremendous on the trade. And hopefully we'll keep looking at this open portfolio will fast forward a few months and we'll see how it turns out. But the fear of missing out, or I should say the fear of that missed opportunity is going to be a much greater motivator. And you just have to be willing to take the trade and have no regrets. Now, how do you do that? Well, like I said last week, I call it the Steve Winwood trade. When you see a chance, you take it. Okay, you know that there's going to be the the potential of a loss, and you have to be willing to accept that. And then you also know, and this is something I've been very cognizant. There's that word we talked about a few weeks ago. Something I've been very cognizant of lately is how much time my positions feel underwater. Oh, feel underwater. How many time? How much time my positions are underwater, and how emotional I feel about those positions being underwater. Okay. So when you see a chance, you have to take it, provided it is intuition and not intuition. Okay. Make sure that ideally the sector is trending and persisted in its trend and accelerating its trend. The overall market is trending and persistent in its trend and accelerating its trend and all those other things I talk about. And then the individual stock obviously trades cleanly and ideally is persistent and trending and accelerating its trend. Or at the least, it is making a very nice, obvious emerging trend or emerging trend is developing. So you definitely want to make sure that you pick the best and you left the rest. But Dave, how do we do that? I wish it was like a course or something that you that you had out there for the well, I do have a course out there. I'm glad you asked. Go to my website, go to the store, or go to this direct link here, and you can get the stock selection course. At the least, what I would encourage you to do, and I'm also going to give away uh, I think the first four videos in this introduction course. At the least, watch those first four videos in the introduction course when they're available, hopefully over the next month or so. And at the least, go to this website address and watch that hour video there on stock selection because some of the biggest things, some of the most important things, such as net-net price change, are covered in that one-hour video.
Now, there are some other details, and that's why it took me another 13 hours to get the other details. But at least watch that, and you're going to be well on your way. And it's going to stop you from, number one, trading a lot of bad stocks. And then number two, it's going to stop you from asking me about stocks here that are that are crappy, at least a, a, a big portion of them, because just by following simple things like net-net, price change, overhead supply, et cetera, is going to help to keep you out of those stocks. So again, outcomes are noisy. Don't worry about making money all the time. Focus on making money over time. And there have been some people that have uh, talked about me out there very nicely, I should add. I think it was Gary Kaltbaum or whatever. It's like, this guy's not right all the time, but he's right over time. And when he's wrong, he tells you he's wrong. Boy, that was a huge compliment. And... Um, and it really, it really made me feel good about what I do. And that's why I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong and I don't try to outsmart the markets. And that's how I became known as a trend following moron. So getting back to yes, your attitude is going to be more important than your aptitude. I get more questions from the rocket scientist type of traders that I have on the service. And I don't want to point out um, what these professions are because if, if somebody will think I'm singling them out. But I have rocket scientist type of, of clients, at least a few of them out there. And I get more questions from them than I do the, the people who aren't in these very, uh, what do you call it, logical, uh, complex fields. And the people who are in these other fields, their attitude tends to be a little bit better because they know that they don't know everything and they know that they don't have to know everything and their attitude is so much better. I've often talked about my daughter was in a stock picking contest. She did exceptionally well. And uh, this kid showed up my house once and I taught him about 10 minutes what to do. And basically I was just telling him, just buy new highs, okay? And then he says, well, if you should mention sell stocks every now and then, fine. Sell anything that's at a loss. And if nothing's at a loss, sell your smallest gainer. And that was a whole system that I gave him. And especially in a market like right now, you'll print money. Now, it did happen. It did help that both my daughter and this uh, kid were in good markets. So the markets became good like right after their contest started and the markets were trending. But even if they weren't, I'm sure they would have done a lot better than everybody else in the class, the rest of the class who were trying to buy things that they knew, such as GameStop or whatever, Netflix, as opposed to buying things that are going up. So attitude is a lot more important than aptitude. And I wouldn't call myself a trend following moron if I didn't truly really believe that. Now, keep in mind, I didn't come up with the name, hey, I'm going to call myself a moron. It was because someone who I really respect, who was written about in some of these books that I'm looking at right now on my bookshelf, basically was fighting the trend. And I don't know if he blew up or not because we lost contact after this. He became really nasty with me. And he called me a trend following moron one day. And I was really hurt. But like I said last week, yeah, you know what? Decided to uh, embrace that shit. Got me some buttons made. Um, got some t-shirts made, you know, it's like, okay, you want to call me that? Maybe I am, you know, I'd start, I find myself, wait, there, there you go again, Dave, drawing that big blue arrow on the chart. Maybe you are a trend following moron. But embracing that, embracing what you don't know really will help you out and embracing that you don't have control over the other market participants, embracing that you're taking an educated guess, embracing that you could be wrong this time, but you'll probably do okay over time, again, if you're picking the best and leaving the rest and following your system. Now, again, you want to follow something that's conceptually correct, knowing that the short term might be a little bumpy. Again, outcomes are noisy, but longer term, you'll be just fine. And again, like I said, there's a lot of other people in the market and you're trading the traders, not the market. It might be a great company, 
And the company might be going great places and doing great things. And maybe they'll cure something. Maybe they'll do this, whatever. They'll sell a lot of products. But you're trading the other traders. And one thing that I really emphasize in the beginner's course, going all the way back to the very, very, very basics about trading traders and not trading markets, is that people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. And quoting Tom McClellan's late mother, Marion McClellan, some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, and others use more sophisticated methods. And going back to the reasoning that Dick Fruth points out from Fruth Capital Management over in Houston, he talked about early in his broker days, when he before he became a money manager, long before he became money manager, people actually would bring the shares in, and Dick's pretty gregarious. He'd sit them down and talk to them and say, why are you selling? Well, I'm getting married, I'm getting divorced, I buy the house, my kid's going to school. Rarely did any of these reasons have anything to do with the underlying stock. And even if it was some sort of trader out there that was making some kind of trades and not somebody sent a junior to college or getting divorced, getting married, getting buying a house, whatever, maybe it just takes one a-hole group of perfectly good trade. Maybe somebody fat fingers something, okay? It could be, it doesn't even have to be a trader, okay? Um, I know I've told this story a thousand times. I, I need some new stories, and that's why I'm going to go to New York in a couple of weeks, maybe get some new story, stories. Might start traveling the world again. I'm going to meet with someone from India. I might be going to India. Probably do me good, a little good to get out. But the thing is, all it takes is one a hole to screw perfect good trade. I put on some futures trades once, and I think it was still the big contract, and it was a pretty big position. I was making a lot of money, and I felt like a genius. It's like, well, you know what? I'm going to go grab a shower real quick. And when I got back to the office, my position had turned south. And it turned south not because somebody fat thing or something, not because something happened in the markets, but because some idiot, some a-hole, started shooting people in our, nation, in our nation's capital, okay? And initially, I thought it was just a pellet gun, but it turns out it was a 22 or something. And some people actually got shot. But the market tanked on it, you know, sell first, ask questions later. So as I said a few weeks back, I would strongly encourage you to to journal not only your trading actions, but also your emotions. And at the least, be very cognizant of your emotions. And you want to reduce your number of round trips when it comes to emotions. Um, I have a currency position on now that has been underwater for about two weeks, but I haven't stopped out. But of course, I'm looking at it every 10, 15 minutes, sometimes even more and saying, oh, man, I'm still losing money on the thing, you know? So you have to reduce your observations. And by reducing your observations, your life is going to get a lot better. You're not going to put yourself into that constant state of regret, which you'll often be in as a trader because trades will often go against you, even good trades. And then eventually even good trades will go against you. That I can guarantee. Now, by reducing your observations, you're going to put yourself through less emotional round trips, both good and bad. And the other thing you could do is reduce the amount of decisions you make. Now, but Dave, how do you do that? Well, that's easy. Just follow your plan, okay? By letting the market make decisions for you, and I'll give you a couple of cases and points. For instance, I'll recommend a stock, uh, buy XYZ at 740. Okay, or buy you or a whatever that stock was, whatever the price was, and then it'll trigger, and then two days later I'll get an email. Dave, I didn't take the position. What should I do now? It's up three bucks. Well, I don't know. Now it's a little tougher decision because not everything is lined up to get that swing trade out, and to and the market might have changed a little bit, sector might have changed a little bit. Remember, information. Uh, or decisions get tougher as information is changing or uncertain, okay? So the original plan was made with this these static conditions, and this is uh, based on research of month year. So now that the market has been trading for a few days, everything has changed. Now you're faced with a, with a plethora of new decisions. And as you've seen me do before, I've done these decision trees where when you don't follow the original decision, 
it becomes a binary action, and then each binary action becomes a binary action, and it grows exponentially from there. And the more decisions you, you are faced with, the more emotions you're faced with, and the more stress you're going to be faced with. So what you do is you say, okay, well, we're going to, let's say, that's by XYZ at uh, 640. For some reason, this number 640 sticks in my head. I think we had a stock that triggered around there. Well, you could actually put in a stop order, okay, and then go about your business, go about saving lives. And if the stock begins to implode, no capital was put in harm's way. If the stock begins to rally, then you get triggered into the position automatically. So you let the market make that decision for you. Now, another way of doing this, and, and I just want to kind of factor in something I got to ask this week. This would be a good opportunity to do so. Let's say you do trigger into that. Now, I'm not a big fan of limit orders, but let's say you've got your initial profit target up here. And let's say you do have to go off to save lives and you can't, I don't suggest you watch a screen, but let's say you, you can't set an alarm and then deal with it because you know you have to go cut on somebody and you can't have your beeper go off or whatever. Do people still have beepers? <laughs> I got to check my beeper signal. But you can't have an alarm go off while you're busy cutting on someone and just say, oh, hang on a second, let me go make a couple trades. Although I knew a doctor that did carry a laptop with him from exam room to exam room, but that's another story. Anyway, so you could possibly put in a limit order which says, hey, you know what, let's say we're looking for two points on this, I don't know, 840. Let's say this is 840. You could put a limit order to say, okay, if it hits 840, I, I want that price, okay? I'd like to get 840. And then this automatically happens for you, okay? Now, the other thing to do, like I said, again, ideally, you want to set an alarm and then look to take a little action because that way you can apply a little discretion just in case it blows through that profit target and keeps on going. Maybe you could squeeze a little bit out of the trade. But that's a little bit more advanced type of technique. If you don't have the discipline, then by all means, put in a stop order to enter it, enter the trade, and then put a limit order in at that additional profit target. That way you'll get paid on a spike. Linda Rasky used to say, feed the ducks while they're, while they're quacking. So that's kind of what a limit order could do. So yes, it's, it's, trading really is that easy, but only if you want it to be, okay? Now, as I often preach, your journey of 10,000 trades begins with just one trade. So how do you do that? Well, make a plan and just follow it. Come on. It's just one trade, okay? So the market's closed. You did your homework. You looked through a couple thousand stocks. You looked through a couple hundred sectors plus. You looked at the indices. You looked at a few ETFs. You found a setup that you think that's viable because you like the sector. You like the stock. It's set up. It trades cleanly and all those other things I talked about for 14 hours. So you're going to take the trade. Okay, well, that's good. Where are you going to get in? And this is a, I have a, a, a PDF I can give you on this, but it's, it's, in, it's a page in layman's. Uh, you have my permission to, to print that off. And if you don't have it, I can, uh, I can dig it out of layman's. But where are you going to get in? Where are you going to take additional profits? How are you going to trail that stop should things go your way? Where is your protective stop just in case things don't go your way? Okay. So lay all that out ahead of time. And I know it's cliche, but plan your trade and trade your plan. And I would encourage you just to do that on one trade, just one trade. I have written extensively about this. So if you look at my website, you can find some articles on this. So, if you can't, I think this should be, I think it left out the T. So here's the thing. If you can't make a plan and follow it for just one trade, here comes a little tough love. Well, then maybe trading is not for you. Okay? We have to consult the captain on this one, but maybe trading is not for you. Now, as I also wrote in the article, after a little bit of tough love, 
It's up to you, and you can do it. What's his name? Bella? <laughs> you can do it. So just focus intently on doing your homework, outlining a plan, and then following that plan for just one trade. Reduce your observations if you have to. Put as many orders into the market that you have to put in to let the market make decisions for you. Again, maybe use a stop to enter, so you make sure you definitely take the trade. Once you triggered, maybe put an actual hard stop in to make sure you honor that stop. And then if you do have lives to go off and save, or if you're not disciplined, then put it in a limit order at that initial profit target, so you make sure you get that initial profit target. And then once you get the fill on that, you might have to do a little bit of work, but go ahead and bump that stop up to break even because that's what the plan says. And then from there, put in hard stops if you have to, if you don't have the discipline, to continue to follow that plan and follow along. Now, I know I make it sound a lot easier than it really is. But when you boil it all down, that's what I always come back to. When I start getting stressed out and pissed off and screaming and cursing, as I do, because I'm still human, right? Just because I decided to trade doesn't mean I no longer have a pulse. And that's probably why I talk about psychology so much. Because as I wrote one of my columns, I think Israel, uh, the name Israel, or yeah, it's Israel means uh, struggles with God. I'll have to look that up and confirm that. But I wrote about that in one of my columns. Well, I'm the Israel markets. You know, it's like I struggle with markets. Okay, it does not come easy for me. I really have to work my ass off at it. And, you know, truth be told, don't you hate people like, I'll be honest with you, oh, you've been lying to me this whole time? But my, uh, my therapy is this, and that's why I write so much about psychology. My therapy is, holy shit, if I don't follow my own plan, how could I expect my clients to do the same thing? So it forces me to do that, okay? And it forces me to recognize those bad behaviors. And I kind of live vicariously through others sometimes because I get a lot of emails from people doing bad behaviors. It's like, ooh, that reminds me. Do I have a stop in this position? Or, ooh, that reminds me. Am I tempted to micromanage myself out of this position? And so it serves as sort of a constant reminder. So from a selfish standpoint, it really helps me out tremendously. Um, this was left in from last week, but I think it's still relevant. It's on the, uh, it's still on the home pages of my website page of my website, 17 tra Trading Resolutions for 2017. Remember, all trades will eventually end badly. You flat out lose. You make a little to get stopped out, or you make a lot, but then to give up a sizable portion of profits in the end. This is following my methodology. Your mileage may vary. Knowing ahead of time that there's going to be some pain in every trade makes it a lot easier when, not if, it occurs. So again, when, not if, Keith, in that key, sentence in that paragraph. Uh, I'm still working on a learning management system. Uh, as I said a few minutes ago, I've got uh, four videos done and uh, nearly edited at this point and nearly uploaded and nearly ready to start rolling out. And I have another 14 or 10, I forget how many, there's quite a few. But there's another maybe 10 to 15 videos that I need to do. And the beginner's course is going to be pretty good. And I'm pretty excited about it because a lot of the, the slides that you've been seeing over the last two years are coming straight from that beginner's course. And it made me realize that, well, maybe it's not such a beginner's course. A lot of things I just covered are in the course and that you have to you have to follow these things. And important things like the net net price change, your trading traders, and not trading markets. All it takes is one a-hole to screw up your trade. And all these other things that are crucial for your success. And in fact, come back to the basics whenever you find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator or, or counting waves or something like that. Anyway, I'm going to have a multi-part portion of that's going to be free. Uh, make sure you're at least on a delayed service so you can follow along with these trades. And, and the reason, one reason that I put a delayed service, you know, in addition to obviously getting people hooked on it and making them want to uh, upgrade to the real-time service, but one of the reasons I did it was so when I give these presentations each week and I show the portfolio, you can't say that I'm picking and choosing. You get to see everything, again, warts and all. So make sure you're at least on the delayed service. And a couple of you have emailed me, and believe me, it's not a problem. We all start somewhere. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but if you've been on it for 
about a year or so, you'll probably get bumped off because there is a space limitation. And here's the deal. If you've been following along for a year, you're, sure you're, not, you're not sure whether you want to trade the service or not. You probably should be trading because good traders make quick decisions. There's a little bit more tough love. I'm going to start being a little bit more tough love with you people, try to get you up to speed. But if you are, like I said a second ago, um, if you're a student or you don't have a lot of money and you just want to learn the methodology, by all means, shoot me an email and just say, hey, Dave, do you mind uh, if I continue to follow along and I promise I won't bump you off. And if I do bump you off, sign back up and I make sure you, uh, you'll get at least another a year on that or whatever it takes. Got any questions, shoot me an email. And then obviously we have a lot of free stuff on the website. All right, let's go to live charts. You guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so. Uh, any comments, complaints, uh, interesting anecdotes, or thoughts about anything we've done so far, let me know uh, as we get these charts set up and get ready to go here. Yeah, keep them coming. I want to take a look at the major mid groups uh, here real quick. But first of all, let's take a look at the indices. Yeah, keep those stock picks coming. Um, wow, two people asked about the same exact stock. That's, that's cool. As the first two stocks. That's interesting. All right, the P's. Well, first of all, what do we have here? Big blue arrow, right? Um, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but I am in some... Occasionally, I lurk in some of these uh, professional private traders forums that have been invited to be in, and, and I've seen where some people are calling tops. I've been calling a top for a long, long time. Well, trends exist as long as people fight them, you know, and your life gets a lot easier when you become a moron, a trend following moron, that is, not a moron in general, obviously. <laughs> and just draw the arrows and follow along. And the other thing, which is, has been a bit of epiphany for me, is that if a market is within a certain percentage of its old highs, let's say a few percent, then err on the side of that longer-term trend. Err on the side of the uptrend if a market is at or near or not too far from its all-time highs. Now, I haven't done the research on this. But I think it'd be kind of interesting research to go into the markets and look at the drawdowns from highs and see what that percentage was before it got worse. And, and I hate to use a, a system designer's term because I don't program systems anymore, but uh, the maximum adverse excursion, the EMAE, I think it's what they used to call it, or I guess they still do, before the market uh, actually recovers from it. So obviously at some point, you have to be willing to say, well, this market has turned a corner. But as long as it's not too far from its old highs, and I don't know exactly what that percentage is, but give it at least a few percent, like right here, what was it, 1.45%. Uh, it looks like a bit of a sell-off, but that's only, it's not even a percent and a half sell-off on a net-net basis. It's not enough to worry about. So air on the side of the longer-term trend, and we had a little breakout here, and then, you know, of course, it came right back in because the market doesn't always – doesn't always just go in a straight line. It likes to fake people out. It likes to fool the most amount of people. So it came right back down, touched the top of its base. As I often say, sometimes the market will come back to kiss the base goodbye. In this particular case, so far, so good. A little bit of weakness today, but hey, not enough to worry about. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ has been in a nice, persistent trend. It has generally gone up day after day after day after day for a few weeks. Uh, all of these indices, not so much the Russell, but uh, the S&P and, and the NASDAQ for sure, are really due for a correction in here. And yes, they will have a correction. That's one of the few things I can guarantee. But what's cool about the NASDAQ is maybe that correction will just be a bit of a pullback because we had this nice thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback. Hopefully, and I don't say the word hope, but hopefully rinse and repeat, getting back to that, that video on the stock selection page, I'm pretty sure, I don't remember exactly everything that's in it, but I'm pretty sure I talked about the importance of this uh, stair-step type of pattern when it comes to markets. It's a very important pattern to recognize. We don't know if that trend's going to end tomorrow, but you're better off playing that trend than fighting that trend. Eventually it will end, okay? But you might just have a few pullbacks along the way and the trend will continue. Let's take a look at the Russell. 
Russell finally beginning to break out a little bit. Again, air on the side of longer-term trend. What happened yesterday broke out. What happened today? Eh, not so much, okay? So don't get too caught up in that, just like the the NASDAQ pulling back a little bit here and there and the P's pulling back to its base. But ideally, yeah, you know me. I sure would like to see this market break out and not look back for a while. But as long as it's at or near these prior highs, I'm not going to get too excited. Let's pop out to these to the major MIGs real quick. And let's take a look at these guys. So as you go through these major MIGs, what a market is do it especially well. I like to look at these uh, the major MIGs, and by the major MIGs, not the, not the, all the little ones um, in here. Now I do look at all 200, 238 of these every day, but when the market's doing very well, I like to just make sure the the, the sectors are confirmed. Because as you can see, there's hardware up at new highs, the banks were at new highs, the Fed was at new highs. Uh, conglomerates, new high software. Uh, you have hardware. You need software for your hardware. Right at new highs. Durables, new highs. Non-durables not doing so great, but non-durables can be seen as a defensive area. Okay, so sometimes non-durables do pretty good in a bear market, and so so in a bull market, and that's because people still need to use toiletries and uh, disposable items in a bear market, okay? Food's another area. People still eat, you know. They still eat and eat toilet paper, right? Uh, the diversified services, near new highs. Now, one thing that's encouraging here is drugs, which haven't been doing so great, kind of wide loose and all over the place. But in more recent times, they have begun to improve. Semiconductors, brand new highs, as you can see. Energies, well... Not fantastic, but they've come back, and they're trying to get back through this range in here. I wouldn't rush out and buy a bunch of energies now, but longer term, looks like they're still in an uptrend. A little iffy in here, stalling at this base. I get a little concerned. Let's put the bow ties in. Uh, yeah, the bow ties been a crossover and all, but it's not a coming off of an all-time high or anything, so I wouldn't get too excited about that. Uh, for financials, let's take a look at the actual ETF. The financials, this... Uh, Morningstar Financials has a bunch of funds in it, so it doesn't give you a true representation of what's happening. But you can see, if you look at the sector ETF, so far it's broken out of its base. That looks good to me. Uh, food's not so high, but it's another one of those offensive areas. Nothing to get excited about there. Take a look at the health services, getting a little traction in here. So far, so good. Big blue arrow pointing up there now. Insurance, brand new highs. Internet, doing pretty good. Banging out new highs in here. Leisure, not so bad. Manufacturing, hey, you know, you're going to build that wall. You're going to need some manufacturing, and you're going to need some materials of construction, which looks okay. Media doing pretty good in spite of certain people not liking them. <laughs> Metals and mining, not so bad. Broke out recently. Okay, so far so good there. Again, air on the side of the longer-term trend. Real estate not doing so hot, but that's okay. Uh, we probably will be faced with higher rates at some point. You can see that interest rates basis the TLT kind of sideways as of late but obviously they dropped late last year and that was a little bit of a concern but now they're beginning to kind of bottom out at least stabilize for now so that's certainly a good thing as I preached quite a bit going way back to earlier this year in late December at least it's no longer a route lower like we saw late last year um, retail not doing so hot, but retail improving at least over the short, short term. Okay, I wouldn't rush out and buy retail stocks unless you had the mother of all setups because that's that mid-range problem we talked about before. I like to see it up here at clear air, okay? But they're certainly improving in the short term. And then, you know what? A few more days, weeks like this, they'll be back at new high, so that will be a good thing. Uh, telecom's kind of all over the place, not so great. Tobacco banging out new highs, that's a defensive area, but it's doing pretty good nonetheless. Transport's banging out new highs. Utilities, not so hot, but that's interest rate sensitive, so let's not get too excited about that. But, you know, it's just all multi-month highs. So the point I'm trying to make is all of these sectors, and most of these sectors are doing fairly well. The rally has legs. It's broad-based, and there's going to be some shakeouts and fakeouts along the way. There's going to be a lot of naysayers along the way. There's going to be a lot of people trying to poo-poo the rally. 
but I wouldn't get too excited about that. Somebody emailed me a while back, said they were out in the markets because they didn't like Trump. Well, that's a horrible excuse to not be in the markets, okay? Um, you can't get caught up in the news and you can't get caught up in the geopolitical situation or economics or anything like that or the economy because that'll mess up your trading. That'll muck up your trading. And I've gotten into heated debates with uh, my uh, in-laws because they're very one-sided when it comes to their politics. And I try to stay, at least publicly, I try to stay fairly neutral. In fact, one of my clients got it completely wrong, thought I was on the other side. No, I'm not on that side. But anyway, but in these heated debates, I try to explain to them that I cannot get caught up in this too much because it will affect my trading, and I have to try to stay as neutral as possible. Okay. All right. Uh, Rick asked about a stock and left, so we can talk about Rick. Oh, that Rick, I tell you. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, some of these uh, stock picks you guys have here. Sam says, start a trend following moron club. I'll join. Yeah, I need to. Back when they had Cafe Press, uh, I don't know if they still exist, but I had shirts and mugs and T-shirts, uh, or yeah, over there uh, with it. Jeff wants to know about Jill. He's been waiting patiently. And Jill actually wants to know about the same exact stock. Uh, this is Cement Day. Um, it looks fantastic. Okay, and it looks like a fantastic setup. The only thing that I'm kind of noticing here is it's only went, it's only gone from 25 to like eh, 30. So it's still a decent run, but it's not a huge run for something like an IPO. You would expect a little bit more excitement, but I'll give it an okay. All right, um, and it could use a tiny bit more pullback, but it certainly looks okay. Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily. Uh, What's the old saying? Kick them out of bed for eating crackers, you know, unless you want to. <laughs> I'm going to get myself in trouble. I wouldn't necessarily kick it out, but that's the only thing I could find wrong with it. All right. Rick wants to know about SCON. Uh, hopefully he knows that these are recorded so we could, uh, he could check it out tonight. Um, well, all I'm seeing is a big gap higher. The HV is a little crazy on this one, and it's kind of all over the place. So there's no structure here for me to trade. I often talk about liking more volatile stocks, but that's within reason and with structure, okay? You take a look at some of these uranium stocks that we're going after. They're volatile, but they're, there's some structure there. We have some pullbacks. Or we have some, like, take a look at URG, for instance. It's volatile. Oh, I meant URA, sorry. URA. It's volatile, but there's some structure. Thrust, pullback. Okay, and now another thrust higher. So you want to make sure you have some structure. JNCE for Mr. Brett. Yeah, we just did we just talk about that one? No, okay. Okay, here's a case where you did have an IPO breakout pattern. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. And then uh, first little pullback here. So it started to look kind of interesting. I'd like a little bit more pullback, but absolutely put that on your watch list. It's a tiny bit on the thin stock side, but if you're trading IPOs and you know what you're doing, you can sometimes go after some of these at a little bit thinner. Okay. All right, Rick. Uh, oh, you had to go. Okay, no problem. Oops, I just accidentally deleted one of your picks. Sorry about that. Uh, MCOA. Symbol not found. And Rick has already left, so we can't find out what he was talking about. SCON. Did we just talk about that one? Yeah, we talked about that one. CLVS for Mr. Chris. Uh, this looks good. I would put this on your watch list. Uh, the only problem is it does have some 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 issues back here. Uh, I would I think I would avoid this stock, even though I hear you. It looks pretty good over here. It does have some bad memories, and I know those bad memories were a long time ago. But you'd be surprised at how our markets will have bad memories, especially when you have a big gap like this. I would just prefer to find something that has clearer air. So I would pass on that one. ORC. Well, speaking of overhead resistance, a little overhead resistance way back here. Um, it's a REIT. I'm not too excited about REITs. HB is a little low at 20, so that's two things, uh, overhead supply. 
Uh, shorter term, I hear you. It looks okay. I'd, I'd like to see more thrust into the pullback, but I would pass for those aforementioned reasons. Uh, SEDG for Jimbo. Uh, it looks like a stock that has bottomed out. Yeah, it looks like it's bottomed out. It's got some overhead around 25, but I'm not going to worry about that too much because if I bought it $15 a share and I got out of 25, I wouldn't be complaining too much, right? Um, it looks okay, and it does have a little little trading back here to worry about. Uh, I hear you, though. I, I see what you're looking at. It looks like it could bow tie soon. You know, maybe throw in your watch lists, okay? But it's not really jumping out at me. It's a fantastic setup. Andre wants to know about PLX. PLX. Okay, let's see. Um, this is one I've been watching. It does have some overhead supply to deal with. It is kind of crazy volatile, okay? So it's interesting, I have to say, but it's crazy volatile and it's not for the faint of heart. And maybe a little bit more knockout would be cool, but it's it's not a bad looking setup, okay? But it's it's it would be kind of dangerous. So be really careful in that one. C E R U. Um no, too much too much bad memories up here. I know if it got to two, that'd be a good problem, but um, it just has too many. It's just kind of all over the place. HV 111, eh, a little on the crazy side. Uh, PULM is one I've been looking at, too, but it's, uh, you boy, you're all over these crazy ones, aren't you? Uh, it's just way too crazy. 325, it went from one to six over a short period of time. That's just absolutely nuts. And uh, I didn't realize it was that volatile. I knew it was volatile, but uh, I would pass. I put that one on my uh, momentum list a couple days ago, but I didn't realize it was that volatile. PSXP. Did we talk about that one? PSXP. Um, yeah, you know, this is refining and marketing. You know, those stocks tend to be a little choppier. I would rather maybe like an oil service stock as opposed to this. And just draw a horizontal line going back to the left. And you can see there's a lot of overhead supply to deal with. So, again, you know, you can see these simple concepts are coming out over and over in, the, in here. And that's why, even though it's a beginner's course, I, I keep saying, well, maybe it's not such a beginner's course because there's a lot of things in here that need to be obvious, uh, or maybe obvious to me, but not obvious to everyone. EGI. Yeah, it's another one of those uh, volatile ones, gold stock. Uh, maybe on a pullback. Let's back the chart out a little bit, see what we got. Uh, it's thin, though. It's really thin, and it's cheap, so I'd be careful. But, yeah, maybe on a pullback if you're a very aggressive trader. You're welcome, Chris. Anytime, man. Yeah, that edit was one that would – this is one that I had to service a while back, and it never did trigger. And I left it in my watch list, and I explained to everybody, it just looks like a big bottom. Let's put the bow ties in and see. Yeah, you see it bow tied way back here, but it never did really take off from that bow tie. And then we eventually took it off because it, it never did uh, take off. Jim, are you in it from the service or, or did you get it on your own? Um, but I kept telling people it looks like a bottom, but it's kind of like a non-specific pattern. ARNC, but uh, wait for follow through and then a pullback on that one. ARNC. All right, this looks a little interesting. Aluminium. Let's back the chart out. Somebody said, are you from England? You say aluminium. No, I'm a coon ass. I'm from Cajun land. <laughs> I just I just like saying aluminium because it's fun to say. What was that Adam Sandler skit? Zinc by far is my favorite element. I also like plutonium, mainly because it's fun to say. How's your plutonium? Fine, thank you. Um, yeah, this looks pretty good, but wait for a pullback. Nice little uptrend uh, intact here. Uh, it's metals and mining, so it could be a little choppy. You got a little bad uh, memories way back here, but I think that's okay in this particular case. But yeah, on a pullback, put on your watch list. Cala, I like. I do like that one. CALA. It needs a pullback, though. Also, the only thing I'm, I'm a little concerned is, is most of this jump was a quantum leap over just a couple days. Um, this is one that we like back here, but I think I was, I was picking it apart. Didn't like it for a couple of reasons, but yeah, it took off without us. Uh, I think I would pass on this one. HV2 crazy now. It's, it's already, 
uh, doubled over a short period of time. TSCO for Miss Elizabeth. Good to see you, Elizabeth. I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, no, this is kind of rolled back over. Um, I would leave that alone. I mean, look at your net net change. It's going down, what, 6% over the last three months. It's at a big gap down here. Um, stay away from that, obviously. AXTI. I think we talked about that one already, did we? No? Uh, this should go on a watch list. A little on the thin side, though. Eh, not incredibly thin, but thin. Um, yeah, this one, Andre, needs a little bit more follow-through, a little more follow-through, and then maybe a pullback could be. It's doable, but on a pullback, obviously. JNT, did we talk about that one? Yeah, a little more pullback would be great on that one, but it looks good. Put in your watch list. Uh, no, AMRN, no. Uh, you know, again, like I said repeatedly, you know, what's your net net change? Um, not much. I mean, 5%, go back a day uh, or two. You know, it just really hasn't gone anywhere in a long time. So wait for a breakout and then play a pullback. PME? Uh, yeah, on a pullback. Now, it's a food, and foods aren't doing that great, but sometimes you can make an exception. Um, HV, a little crazy. It has run, ran up about 400% already. So it's going to be a rough ride on that one. Could be wild and crazy, but yeah, maybe on a pullback. CRNT, did we talk about that one? Um, yeah, a little more. See, it didn't really get past this base too much before breaking out, this latest base in here. Uh, so wait for, I guess it'd have to break out again and then a pullback. Stop me if you've ever heard me say that before. All right, we the picks have slowed down. Any anybody else? Any new ones? Anybody else? With, any stocks? I'll give it a couple seconds. Here we go. ATKR. Yeah. Uh, oops, you maybe slip up. Um, yeah, Brett, we need to stay off the Landry list if you don't mind. <laughs> Caught me off guard. Uh, NTNX. Uh, a little too sideways, obviously. Um, you know, it's, 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 I mean, I hear you, it's going up lately, but it would actually have to break out to new highs for me to get excited about it. That's okay, Brad. It's, it's, you know, it was my fault for not catching that. Not your fault. Is it still okay? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, the day ain't over. Yeah, so what? It gapped out a little bit. Just follow the plan. Follow the plan, okay? And then at the end of the day, reevaluate the plan. Yeah, we're long salt. That was in the, um, in the list, obviously. And, uh, what I would do with this one is wait for the next breakout and then look to play a pullback. <laughs> ah, thanks a lot, Dave. My bad again. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Trying to trip me up. Twilio has been bottoming out. I've been watching this one. Um, yeah, I mean, it looks pretty good. Now it's kind of bottomed out. I mean, somebody was picking a bottom in this one a while back, and I thought they were crazy. But now uh, it's kind of like that edit. It just looks like a big bottom, but it's not exactly set up just yet. Uh, this is all over my, my watch list, or it's in my watch list for sure. Uh, I wait to see if it can rally a little bit more. I did look to play a pullback along the way, but, yeah, I think it's uh, – I think it's worth watching. Absolutely. Good eye on that one, Sam. Uh, O-R-E-X. Can we talk about that one? Uh, let's see. Let's clean up this chart. My only problem with this one is it just kind of moves in these really big chunks. One big up day and then a couple of big up days. Um, HB, a little too crazy. Andre, you're all over these uh, super volatile ones. I hear you, though. This is one that's been in my momentum list for a while. Now that I'm looking at it. Uh, it looks like a huge bottom, but it also looks like it'd be a incredibly risky trade. But I hear you, man. Oh, you quoted me on Twitter? Thank you, man. I appreciate that. At Trader Geek. Oh, cool. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. Uh, Joe wants to know about NNA. Sounds like an 80s band, huh? Or was that NWA? Um, 
No, we're too sideways, okay? And the net net is just too sideways, okay? So what would have to happen now is it would actually have to break out to new high somewhere around two-ish, maybe a little bit more, and then look to play pullbacks along the way. But it's okay to keep a new watch list, but there's nothing to do for a while there. Massey? Yeah, this is in a nice trend. Uh, let's see. Volume is okay. HV is a little bit low. Where are the P's right now? HV, where's the NASDAQ? Might be low because it's trending. That's the only thing that's kind of a little counterintuitive. Um, oh, where's my HV? I think I lost my HV. Maybe the spiders, maybe? Yeah, spiders are at 7. That, that is pretty low. And that's probably because they've gone sideways and then they persisted at a tread. Um, getting back to the Massey, uh, HV seems a little low. Um, it just kind of plods along. I'd like to see a little bit more acceleration and maybe a pullback. The problem with trading a stock that's not very volatile is that you're going to have to trade more shares. And if something bad happens, which could happen, you're going to have a lot of shares on. Whereas if you're trading a more a stock that's more volatile, it's kind of like better the devil you know. Now, within reason, we looked at some stocks that had HV of 150 a few minutes ago, and I said they were too volatile. Even some around 100 were too volatile. But it's like sometimes, you know, so sometimes you can have too much of a good thing. But in a case like this, I think it needs to be – I would prefer trading something that was a little bit more volatile uh, just because something bad could still happen. But maybe if it accelerates higher and does a little trend knockout or something, it might be worthwhile. I hear you, though, on that one. STM. Um, yeah, this one's doing pretty good. Now, see, this is a better example. Uh, Chris was asking about that other stock, too. Uh, now, it is a foreign stock, so you will have some gaps in here, but I wouldn't get too excited about that. But you can see that. You know, just draw some uh, lines in here, or eyeball it, and you can see it has accelerated higher and it has pulled back. I think this was in my list uh, a few days ago. Uh, so far, so good, but now it's going to have to break out the new highs and then pull back again. So this needs to be in your watch list, but it's not uh, specifically set up going into tomorrow. A-C-I-A. -A. Uh, yeah, I like this. It's bottoming out. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Uh, I'd prefer if it was bottoming out at lower levels. Um, boy, that was a nice little IPO pullback here, huh? Uh, it looks okay. I, again, I prefer if it was at all-time lows since it's an IPO. Um, maybe on continued breakout on a pullback, and it's probably going to be a bow tie soon. Yeah, it'll bow tie soon. But I, I think I would pass just because I'd prefer if it was just coming off a of major low levels being a transitional pattern. But if it does bow tie up, you could certainly do a lot worse than that. I mean, so I'll give it a not bad. I'm kind of picky sometimes, as you know, when it comes to these stock things. All right, any more questions? C N H I C N H I. Okay. Um. Well, I'm seeing a little bit of a net-net problem here, okay? Um, not much progress in, what, uh, three, four weeks in here, kind of sideways. And then not much progress somewhat longer term. Now, you got to keep this uh, relevant to its HV. So relative to its HV, it's still not a whole lot of progress. I hear you, though. Longer term, yes, uptrend looks pretty good. But what I would do, Gary, is uh, wait for it to break out to new highs and then look to play the pullbacks along the way. Uh, also, notice the prior high in here. You want to see stocks kind of take out their prior highs decisively before looking to play a pullback. So, and again, this goes back to watch that. Uh, and this is a great thing about the, um, the learning management system is I'll know whether or not uh, you watch the stuff or not. I'm not going to go in and look at everybody to see what they're watching. But if you ask me questions, I'll go in and say, well, wait a minute. You didn't watch the part of the, of the lesson where I talked this, so you need to go in and watch it before you ask me about it. Not that I'm being mean. I'm just saying. Um, and I think this is also in that intro video on stock selection. You want the pullback. 
you don't want it to look like this. You want to make sure if you have a pullback that it clears that prior high decisively. Kind of like that thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback pattern that we have working right now in the NASDAQ. So this is what you want to see. This is what you want to see over here and not this, okay? All right, I think we are out of time or nearly out of time. Uh, any more questions? While we're in impasse, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email at daviddavelandry.com. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Uh, I don't know my schedule over the next couple of weeks. Uh, next week, I actually leave for New York. So I need to figure out whether or not I could squeeze a show in before I leave. And then coming back from New York, I'm going to be slammed. So uh, I'm not sure how it's going to all work out. So we might miss a show over the next week or two. So keep an eye out for um, the schedule on that. Uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate you guys showing up. Uh, thanks to everyone else. Uh, again, everybody enjoy your weekend. And uh, anything unanswered, shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com. And if uh, it requires a lot of thought, I'll just use it uh, as fodder for an upcoming show. Thank you guys and girls so much. You're welcome. You're welcome, Andre. You're welcome, Leon. Cool. See you. Yeah, I'll see you in New York. Uh, yeah, New York. Uh, week after next. So see you guys there.